Welcome to the special series, COVID-19, What Pharmacists Know Now, brought to you by the Canadian Society of Hospital Pharmacists, BC Branch. Today, we are going to discuss what we know now about COVID-19 in pregnancy and breastfeeding. My name is Dr. Hilary Rowe, and I'm a registered pharmacist in British Columbia. I'm a clinical pharmacy specialist in maternal fetal medicine at Surrey Memorial Hospital, and a clinical instructor for the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences at the University of British Columbia. I have no conflicts to declare for this presentation, However, I would like to remind everyone that the COVID-19 pandemic is rapidly evolving, and we have very limited research in specialty populations, such as pregnancy and lactation. The information presented today is based on all available evidence as of April 12, 2020. Today, we are going to review the latest evidence for four topics. We're going to look at the specific risks of COVID-19 infection in pregnancy. We're going to look at the risk of perinatal transmission. We'll briefly talk about an approach to treatment. And lastly, discuss what to do if you are breastfeeding and have COVID-19. At present, there are no data to determine if pregnancy increases the susceptibility to COVID-19 infection. However, the physiologic changes of pregnancy can increase the risk of poor outcomes from other respiratory infections. This means that pregnant women have been at an increased risk of hospitalization and ICU admission from other types of respiratory infections. At present, there are no data suggesting pregnant women are at higher risk of severe illness than the general population for COVID-19. However, the number of pregnant women reported in the literature thus far is very small. We do need a comparison with non-pregnant women of similar age and similar health to answer this question, rather than a comparison to all persons with COVID-19, as this comparison typically includes those of older age and also those with different underlying medical conditions than the pregnant population. The first paper that we're going to focus on is a systematic review of 108 pregnancies. The literature search for this systematic review was conducted between December 8, 2019 to April 4, 2020. It included all women with a confirmed case of COVID-19 that was pregnant on admission. It also included all case reports that were found in English and Chinese, and they excluded unpublished reports and any report that was deemed to be suspicious of a duplicate. 18 articles and 108 pregnancies were included. The mean age of these patients ranged from 29 to 32 years. These women were primarily in their third trimester. However, 22 of them were in earlier gestation. These women were discharged undelivered without any major complications. However, the final outcomes of their pregnancy are still unknown at this time. The comorbidities of the patients in this study included preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, hypothyroidism, and placenta previa. It appears that pregnant women have similar presenting signs and symptoms of COVID-19 as the general population. In the systematic review, fever on admission was the most common in 68% of patients. In addition, the laboratory findings were also similar in these pregnant women. About 59% of them had lymphocytopenia, and about 70% of them had an elevated CRP greater than 10 mg per liter. At this time, there are no maternal mortalities in the literature, however, there are three maternal ICU admissions. I would like to briefly discuss the three maternal admissions to ICU. If you'd like to look at these cases in detail, please look at the resources to the bottom right. The first case is a 31-year-old female who is 34 weeks pregnant who was diagnosed with COVID-19. She ended up having multiple organ dysfunction and acute respiratory distress. This led to an emergency cesarean section, and unfortunately, her infant was stillborn. This mother did require ventilator support and ECMO, and at the time of publication, the final outcomes of her case were unknown. The other two cases of ICU admission were women of term gestation. They both had high BMIs and multiple comorbidities, such as poorly controlled diabetes, chronic hypertension, asthma, and were both admitted to hospital for an induction. After they both had failed inductions, one became unwell during the OR. She had had a postpartum hemorrhage and was intubated, and shortly after was found to have abnormal findings on chest x-ray and some wheezing. She had a, a positive COVID-19 test and was sent to the ICU for about an eight-hour uh, admission. She was discharged four days later without any major complications. The second patient had uh, COVID-19 symptoms developed 25 hours after delivery, and she was admitted to ICU due to severe hypertension. 
Five days after delivery, she was still hospitalized and she was still requiring oxygen and did also have acute kidney injury. Her final outcomes were also unknown at the time of publication. Drug treatment was not well described in many of these case reports. However, oxygen therapy was given to 25 women, 20 women received antiviral therapy, and 27 women were given antibiotics, most likely to prevent a bacterial infection or potentially it was also given before cesarean section. Four women were given corticosteroids and this was felt to be given due to maternal indications and not for fetal lung maturation. 86 of 108 women were delivered in these case reports. 92% of them were delivered by cesarean section. Of the 48 cases where the gestational age at birth was recorded, 42% of them delivered before 37 weeks. These women though did have a number of complications in their pregnancy that were not related to COVID-19 that may have been a factor in these deliveries that were before 37 weeks. In addition, fetal distress was commonly reported as the indication for cesarean section However, the reasons for the fetal distress were not reported. There are three neonatal outcomes of particular interest. The first is the case of an infant who had passed away at day nine of life. The second is a stillborn, which we have already discussed in the maternal ICU admissions. And the third is a case of vertical transmission. We'll discuss this in more detail further along in the presentation. For the infant who unfortunately passed away at day nine of life, this was a neonate who was born at 34 weeks and five days gestation. The clinicians caring for the neonate felt that the neonate passed away from a significant viremia. The infant was felt to be in shock with multiple organ failure and DIC. A throat swab obtained on day nine of life when the infant passed was negative for COVID-19. Based on lymphocytopenia and thrombocytopenia that has been reported in well-looking infants that have also had abnormal findings on chest x-ray, it is thought to be very important to monitor all neonates who are born to women who are positive for COVID-19, as some of the authors in these publications have felt that there could be a subclinical infection in some of these neonates. Although this systematic review has been very helpful in reviewing all of the case reports and case series of women with COVID-19 in pregnancy, we still need to remind ourselves that we only have a small number of women who have been reported thus far in the literature. Also, many of these case series have very poor methodology and are missing a lot of outcome data that would be helpful for us to know. At this time though, we have learned that women are presenting with the typical signs and symptoms and laboratory changes that we're seeing in the general population. We have been unable to assess the risks in early pregnancy and what the outcomes would be if a woman had been infected in first or second trimester. We are also unable to completely rule out vertical transmission, although there's not seem to be uh, numerous studies or numerous cases that are leading to this as being a concern at this time. And overall, the majority of cases do not have major complications, but there has been three admissions to ICU and two cases in which the final outcomes are unknown at this time. We are now going to review the case of a woman who gave birth to a preterm infant due to COVID-19 infection. This woman was 28 years old and she presented with intermittent fever for about one week. She was around 30 weeks gestation and during this time she'd had two throat swabs done for COVID-19 and both were negative. As her symptoms progressed, it sounds like her team had done an a CT and found some abnormal chest findings and around the same time had also had her sputum test result come back and it ended up being positive for COVID-19. She was transferred to the ICU and found to have an elevated CRP, LDH, lymphocytopenia, and low albumin. And she was requiring oxygen therapy, antivirals, antibiotics, and was being given daily human serum albumin. This patient was felt to be getting more unwell as the days passed, and they thought she was at increased risk of preterm birth. So in this case, they actually did give her dexamethasone for fetal lung maturation and magnesium sulfate for fetal neuroprotection. At this time, I would say this is the first case that has been reported in the literature where dexamethasone or a steroid in general was given for fetal lung maturation. Around this time that she was given these therapies, a repeat CT was done that was showing a more uh, severe form of atypical pneumonia. And later on that day, the patient reported no fetal movement. And when they were doing their fetal heart rate tracing, it sounds like there was no variability. After they did about four hours of maximal ventilator support, uh, they still found no improvement and they ended up delivering this patient via emergency cesarean section for fetal indications. 
At the time of birth, they did look for amniotic fluid, placenta, cord blood, and neonatal gastric juices and, sw and throat swab samples, and found that all of these samples were negative. The infant was separated from its mother and was formula fed as the infant went to the NICU and the mother was still in the ICU. During this time, the two of them had no contact and the mother and infant in the end ended up having an uneventful postpartum neonatal course and were discharged. The first study that we're going to review is a retrospective review published in The Lancet. This review included nine women whose age ranged from 26 to 40 years old. All women were near term, 36 weeks to 39 and four weeks gestation. Three women did have complications in their pregnancy. One had gestational hypertension since 27 weeks, one had preeclampsia since 31 weeks, and the last one had a concomitant influenza infection. All of these women were positive for COVID-19 and felt to have pneumonia. Five of them had lymphocytopenia, six of them had an elevated CRP, and eight of them all had abnormal findings on chest CT. All nine women did receive supplemental oxygen and antibiotics, and six did receive antiviral therapy. All women had cesarean section births, and the indications included severe preeclampsia, a history of cesarean section, fetal distress, and uncertainty of intrapartum transmission by vaginal delivery. However, the number of women that were delivered for this last indication was not reported. Six women did have samples collected, collected at the time of birth for amniotic fluid, cord blood, neonatal throat swabs, and breast milk samples at first lactation. All samples were negative in this study, and they felt there was no evidence of intrauterine vertical transmission at this time. Four of the nine neonates in this study were preterm. However, all of them were greater than 36 weeks gestation. The indications for delivery in these cases were not COVID-19 related, and were related to things such as preeclampsia, the mother having had a history of prior stillbirths, and one patient who had premature rupture of membranes for about 12 hours and was suspecting to have an intrauterine infection. Two of the preterm infants did have low birth weight, however one of these cases was the one in which the woman was known to have preeclampsia. One infant did have changes in myocardial enzymes, however this infant was found to be asymptomatic and well. The next case we're going to look at is one related primarily to vertical transmission. In this case, the woman was 34 years old with a history of hypothyroidism and was 40 weeks pregnant. She had a small amount of vaginal bleeding and lower abdominal pain, and about two hours later developed a new fever. Based on some abnormal findings of her chest CT, which showed possible viral pneumonia, the patient was hospitalized. Due to a worsening clinical picture, the woman was delivered by an emergency cesarean section. During the procedure, the mother wore an N95 and she was delivered under contact, droplet, and airborne precautions. The neonate and mother were separated after birth, and the cord blood, placenta, and breast milk were all negative. In this case, the neonate was reported as stable and well. However, there were abnormal laboratory findings and an abnormal chest x-ray. In this case, the neonate was started on IV prophylactic antibiotics and a nasopharyngeal swab was taken at 36 hours of life. The swab was taken because the mother was found to be positive for COVID-19, and in the end, the neonate was also positive for COVID-19. The neonate was closely monitored in isolation and no special treatments were given. In this case, both the mother and the baby recovered and were discharged. This is the very first case of vertical transmission in the literature. In this case, it has led us to have numerous questions that are unfortunately still unanswered. The first question is, what is the mother's viral load before her symptoms started? And what was the viral load all the way until delivery? Was it high enough in order to cause in utero transmission? This infant was also delivered less than 12 hours after symptom onset, and we wonder if this was enough time for vertical transmission to occur. And finally, because the swab was taken so late after birth, we cannot rule out the risk of nosocomial transmission. So at this time, based on all of this information, vertical transmission cannot be ruled out in this case. On March 26, JAMA published two reports of three newborns with elevated IgM antibodies. Since IgM antibodies are too large to cross the placenta, these reports are suggesting that detection in a newborn could reflect in utero transmission. 
However, an editorial by Kimberlin and others reminds clinicians that most congenital infections are not diagnosed using IgM antibodies because these assays have numerous limitations, including cross-reactivity issues and false positive and false negative results. In these reported cases, the nasopharyngeal swabs from these infants were negative for COVID-19. At this time, it's cautioned that there is no clear evidence of vertical, vertical transmission based on these findings and that further data is needed before this information can be used in clinical practice. In summary, the effects of the virus in early pregnancy are unknown. The literature lacks data for neonates delivered to women who were infected in first or second trimester. When it comes to transmission in third trimester, thus far we only have a small number of pregnancies reported. The evidence of transmission in the neonates described in two of those case reports did have controversial timing of testing and also had controversial type of testing used. So in the one case, the baby wasn't tested until 36 hours of life and then ended up becoming positive. And in the three other cases, IgM antibodies were tested, which is thought to be somewhat controversial in the neonatal population. So at this time, there are no definitive data to support the risk of perinatal transmission. At this time, there is very little information regarding the treatment of pregnant women with COVID-19. The current standard includes symptomatic treatment and being cautious with IV fluid use. We'd also recommend screening for viral and bacterial infections and trying to optimize all therapies for safety in pregnancy or lactation. If a woman was to be started on antibiotics, we could consider empiric therapy for pneumonia with oral amoxicillin if the patient is stable or a third-generation cephalosporin, such as IV cefotaxime, for more severe disease. We would not recommend the use of corticosteroids routinely for maternal indications, but the use of corticosteroids to promote fetal lung maturity is not contraindicated. We would consider this, though, only if preterm delivery is indicated or anticipated based on maternal condition. In addition, we'd also like to recommend that a team approach is used for caring for all of these women. You should consult specialists as needed in obstetrics, maternal fetal medicine, neonatology, intensive care, anesthesia, and your colleagues in pharmacy. Isolation of the infant from a mother with confirmed or suspected infection with COVID-19 is not recommended. Women who intend to breastfeed are encouraged to continue to do so as long as they are feeling well enough. It is also recommended that women have good hand washing before breastfeeding and providing infant care, and wearing a mask while breastfeeding and providing infant care may reduce the risk of transmission. Women should also follow the recommendations for their device for proper cleaning after each use. Breast milk may transmit antibodies to the infant, which could be of potential benefit. However, overall, we have very limited data in lactation at this time. However, we do have some case reports showing that they don't think there's any virus transmitted in the milk at this time. For pregnant and breastfeeding patients, it is especially important to prevent infection. Women should avoid contact with ill persons, avoid touching their face, and wash their hands as frequently as possible. For treatment, we should be optimizing our supportive care and our treatment of complications for the safety in pregnancy and lactation. When it comes to future research, we should encourage reporting outcomes of women infected in first and second trimester. We should also continue to gather transmission data and we should continue to report on maternal and fetal outcomes. I would like to say thank you so much to Jasmine Moore for her help with the literature search for this presentation and to the Canadian Society of Hospital Pharmacists BC branch for inviting me to take part in this lecture series. Please look at the following references should you wish to explore any of the maternal or neonatal cases in more detail.